I would like to use sort of slogan for this lecture, which is Magnetism is one. Once again, if you have a question, please unmute your microphone instead of writing a question in the chat. I will not be able to read the chat because I'm going to do calculations on the board. So, we start with um, Pauli Parman. So, paragraph one, Pauli. Yes? Uh, I said sort of slogan that magnetism is quantum. So, we are going to discuss quantum phenomena today. And magnetism is one of collective or cooperative phenomena which has entirely quantum nature. Okay, uh, the first paragraph, because we are going to discuss today two types of magnetisms of the free electron gas. No interaction, uh, whatever, uh, because as we discussed last time, the interacting electrons uh, can be considered um, in terms of fer Fermi liquid paradigm, and Fermi liquid is different from Fermi gas just by readjusting some parameters, namely effective mass of the quasi particles, excitations, and effective jump of the Fermi distribution function. So, everything what I'm going to say now is equally applicable to interacting system, um, except case when the interaction actually um, force system to change the ground state. This is going to be discussed at the end of the course. Uh, but as long as interactions only modify um, effective parameters of your fermionic systems, we are fine to discuss uh, the ideal uh, Fermi gas for this purpose. So the first part of the lecture is devoted to uh, magnetic properties of free electron gas, uh, which appear uh, due to quantum number of electron which is spin, and the second part will be related to discussion of magnetism associated uh, with the orbital degrees of freedom. So we start with spin, and therefore the first uh, part of the lecture is called Pauli paramagnetism. Para magnetism. I will explain uh, what does it mean para, uh, but let's first <coughs> remind you that we are dealing with spin. This is H um, S. So sorry. We are dealing. Um, we are dealing uh, with magnetic momentum um, of uh, the uh, electrons, and for the moment, I am going to say that orbital degrees of freedom is irrelevant. There is no spin orbital coupling in addition, and therefore, I will characterize uh, the magnetic momentum of the electron in terms of spin. So magnetic momentum is measured in terms of Bohr magneton, and then this is S over S. Of course, when I write a vector, we assume that this is operator, um, and this operator acts on the spin degrees of freedom, so the Bohr magneton, mu Bohr, is E h bar divided by 2 mc. Today I am going to keep h bar explicitly in order to show you that um, we have quantum nature of the magnetism and of course or we have h bar s which is related to spin. So for all today lecture I will consider electrons, namely s equal to one half. This is what I am going to do. So, we need to write very simple Hamiltonian how the magnetic momentum interacts with the magnetic field. So we assume that there is a magnetic field applied to our electron gas. 
For the purposes of calculation, I choose direction of my z-axis, quantization axis, along the direction of magnetic field. Frequently, I am asked where the magnetic field is directed. This is a very wrong question, because the freedom to choose axis is our freedom. Therefore, we decide along which axis magnetic field is directed. For the purposes of my lecture, <coughs> I will assume that um, the z-axis is along um, the direction of magnetic field, and the representation of spin, um, in the representation of spin, Pauli matrix sigma z, which is 1, 0, 0, minus 1, is diagonal. You remember that spin is operator, it represented by three Pauli matrices. For spin 1 half, this is a fundamental representation, uh, 2 by 2, and um, one of the matrices um, is diagonal. For spin 1, for example, it will be representation by 3 by 3 matrices, uh, but for spin 3 half it's 4 by 4, but in any case, there are three spin matrices, and one of them is always there. Um, okay, so the Hamiltonian, which we are going uh, to uh, use, is very simple. This is mu times magnetic field. So, it is first of all proportional to magnetic momentum, and second, it is proportional uh, to the magnetic field. You may ask me why there is a sign minus, because the electron is a negatively charged uh, particle, and I define a constant which is more magneton, um, putting modulus of the charge of the electron. So, uh, I will proceed to the calculations based on the definition of density of states, which we used and introduced during last lecture, we, dis, uh, we define the density of state per unit volume, therefore, as I said, this is dn over d energy. Um, both n and energy are extensive uh, quantities, they are proportional to the volume, therefore the density of state does not, is not proportional, so this is factor of 2, dp over 2 pi h bar q delta function epsilon minus epsilon Okay, so, now, um, let's write separately energy using this Hamiltonian for spin up and spin down. So, energy for spin up is P squared over 2m, sorry, 2m. I'm going to count my energy from the Fermi surface, therefore I will subtract the chemical potential, minus mu, and then, since this is direction up, this Hamiltonian just tells me that this is uh, Sz times B, this is a diagonal matrix, so this is mu minus, mu bor times uh, s over s yeah. uh, so this is mu bor times b because this is one half, this is one half, it cancels what remains is sigma z matrix, we have a mu bor times b minus, because we have a minus here and we have a plus here. Energy for spin down is P squared over 2m minus mu plus mu bar b. Okay? So, from this moment, I will assume that temperature is equal to zero. It simplifies very much calculation but at the end of calculation, I will comment what happens if we have a final temperature. If temperature equal to zero, that mu at zero temperature, chemical potential at zero temperature, is a Fermi energy. So, in this picture, what I plotted here, 
This is epsilon p, this is p, and I put chemical potential. The chemical potential is unique for spin up and spin down, because if chemical potential is different, then there is a current running through the system. So, the chemical potential is unique, although the energies are different, so this is down and this is up. So I can say, I can accommodate, accumulate um, this difference, which is proportional to magnetic field, into the definition of Fermi energies. So I'm saying that Fermi energy up is equal to Fermi energy plus mu bore beam, and Fermi energy down is equal to Fermi energy minus mu bore beam. From here. Then I can write down the number of electrons with the direction up is one half times volume times integral from zero to Fermi energy up, density of states of energy, d energy. Why I put one half? Because I define my density of states with a factor of 2, which assumes that I took a summation of a two-spin projection. Since I'm going to compute number of electrons per spin projection, I need to put one half where the density of states has this factor. So the number of electrons with a spin down is again one half volume integral from zero to Fermi energy down density of states times d energy. I'm interested in magnetization. The magnetization of a system mu is equal to mu bar times number of electrons up minus n electrons down. Because you see that magnetic field lifted the degeneracy between up and down. I remind you that if magnetic field is equal to zero, this is magnetic field not equal to zero. If magnetic equal field equal to zero, we have twofold degenerate ground state, uh, which is insensitive to the spin projection. We apply magnetic field and we change the balance between number of electrons with spin up and number of electrons spin down. So to say we magnetize our system and therefore there is a magnetization associated with the imbalance between up and down. Okay, so if I would like to define magnetization M, which is M per unit volume, then I can write it down as mu bor, and here I have one half, and I divide by the volume, this is integral from zero to thermal energy up, density of state d epsilon minus integral from zero to thermic energy down density of state d energy. Okay, if I have a two integrals, difference of two integrals with the same function, what I have that mu is equal to one half, sorry, it's not mu, it's m capital, it's one half mu bar integral from thermic energy down to thermic energy up, density of state, d n. We discussed on Wednesday that density of states for three d non-interacting electron gas is proportional to square root of epsilon. And we have Fermi energy somewhere here. Um, we are dealing with a relatively small magnetic field. field. What does it mean, small magnetic field? Typically, magnetic field accessible in the lab is of the order of few tesla. Conversion of units of magnetic field, if I use Bohr magneton on one hand, 
and Boltzmann constant. On the other hand, the temperature says that one Tesla is approximately one Kelvin. If we consider the mass of electron coinciding or almost coinciding with the mass of electron as elementary particle. Therefore, for Fermi energies of the order of one electron volt or 10 electron volt, which is 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 Tesla, one Tesla or 10 Tesla is tiny, tiny temperature. Therefore, what we see here is this is Fermi energy down, this is Fermi energy up, and this is a caricature wave. In a sense, if I would like to uh, respect the proper scale, uh, the thickness of chalk will not allow me to discriminate between these two lines. And since it is so, an integration is from the Fermi energy up, down to the Fermi energy up, I am allowed to use the theorem which replaces me this integral, this integral of a Dirichlet space, by rectangular. So this is a square, of course, but I ignore the difference uh, of this line from the straight line, and therefore I'm saying that this is one half mu bore uh, density of states at the Fermi energy times Fermi energy up minus Fermi energy down. Therefore, it is equal to this is Fermi energy up, this is Fermi energy down. I have 2 times mu bore uh, times B, 2 times and 1 half uh, cancel out. So I have mu bore square density of states at the Fermi energy times magnetic field. Okay, this is very simple calculation which tells us very important message. Namely, the magnetization induced in the system for small magnetic field is proportional to magnetic field. So, if I plot magnetization as a function of magnetic field, this is a straight line for small magnetic field. If I define susceptibility, which is a proportionality coefficient between magnetization and magnetic field, so we have this alpha uh, and uh, tan alpha is uh, susceptibility. Um, so uh, susceptibility, which is dm over db, which is then mu bar square times density of state at the Fermi level. I remind you that the density of states at Fermi level is m pf divided by pi square h bar So, the susceptibility is constant. It doesn't depend on anything um, and it's constant at zero temperature. Which means that we apply magnetic field to our electron system and we induce moment which is directed along the magnetic field and there is a direct proportionality between magnetization and magnetic field. So, as I said, the final temperature integrals can be evaluated in the simple form. If I define this susceptibility as chi node, the temperature dependent susceptibility will cast a form chi node. There are small temperature corrections minus pi square t square over 12 Fermi energy square, and so on and so forth. So, as I said, even if I'm at room temperature, say 300 Kelvin, and we have one electron volt Fermi energy, this is the effect of um, 10 to the power minus 4, at least. Um, therefore, we can safely say that susceptibility of uh, the electron gas associated with spin degree of freedom um, is a constant, and this is a positive constant, means that magnetic field is, um, magnetization is directed along the magnetic field. This phenomenon, this phenomenon 
is called paramagnetism. You introduce magnetic moment by applying magnetic field, you turn off magnetic field, and magnetic moment goes back to its zero value. It will be dramatically, drastically contrast to phenomena of spontaneous symmetry breaking, which we are going to discuss in the fourth uh, chapter of our lectures. This is fair and anti fair magnetism. Then you have spontaneous magnetization appear due to effect of interaction. Here, effect of interactions are irrelevant. You apply magnetic field, small magnetic field, your system responds to it. You turn off magnetic field, uh, the system goes back to its non magnetic state. Okay? Any questions? Sir? Sorry, yes. Question. Yes. Yes, yes, please proceed. Okay, why, why, is, why is that term for that, the, the correction of... Because this is how you uh, compute um, integrals with the Fermi distribution function. I assume that the course of statistical mechanics, um, you learn how to do it. If you didn't learn yet how to proceed with the inter take into account temperature effect, please wait until Friday next week, when there will be first tutorial, where all these calculations will be repeated for you and you will practice in computing different um, uh, correlation function at final temperature. Okay? If you want to refresh it now, go okay. to the textbook Landau Lipschitz, very fine, where there is a paragraph how you proceed with the calculation of integrals. The hint is that the Fermi distribution function at zero temperature is a step function. Then, um, say here, you have a Fermi distribution function. As I said, in the first approximation, it is a step function. Um, but you can tailor expand your integrals. The derivative of the Fermi distribution function, namely the derivative of step function, is a delta function. And therefore, you tailor expand, you proceed with computing uh, terms and you get this temperature correction with a proper coefficient. This is how it works. Tutorial will be devoted to technical details, but I assume that this is one of the most important um, actually uh, ways to compute uh, your thermodynamical properties. I presume that in the course of statistical mechanics you already did it. Otherwise I need to go back to statistical mechanics and spend a few lectures which then you will learn less uh, in the course of solid state physics. So we postpone it until tutorial. Okay? But what I'm not going to postpone, um, this is all for paramagnetism. From now on, I have approximately one hour to do calculations with a diamagnetism. And this is lengthy and uh, cumbersome calculations. And in the core of these calculations will be quantum harmonic oscillator. Therefore, I will spend the next 15 minutes to rediscuss um, quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay? Uh, okay, uh, Professor, uh, I want to quickly ask about, uh, about the, the behavior of the density of this, uh, uh, the, the one void paramagnetic system. Here we, we consider it in three dimensions, which we see the energy is quadratic. Uh, in the case that we have either uh, in two dimension or, or even zero dimension, how, how does the spin change? Um, actually, the shape of density of states um, is not that important, as I said, as long as your field is much smaller compared to Fermi energy. Suppose you have a tight binding model. In a tight binding model for two dimensional square lattice, this is going to be the shape of uh, the density of states. Um, for two dimensional, there is a logarithmic uh, peak at the half field. This is what you get from type binding model. Uh, however, if you are not dealing with this log, this log is a subject of chapter number four. Because then effects of interaction, susceptibility then diverges. And the effect of any tiny interaction between electrons are important because it will change the ground state. But if you are sitting here, for example, this your Fermi energy, Fermi energy is here. So these states are filled in, these states are empty. It doesn't matter. 
you are integrating on very small area and you approximate your density of state by constant. For two dimensional free electron gas, the density of state is constant by calculation. For one dimensional um, state, uh, it's one over square root, but it doesn't matter because as long as you are at finite density of electrons and you have a small comparative area in the magnetic field, you can always replace your density of state by constant, except you have some singularity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me proceed with a um, uh, discussion of... 34%? Yes? Uh, could you please repeat your explanation for spin up and spin down uh, in terms of integer? Sorry? Uh, what was spin up spin? spin up and spin down that you have written in blackboard in terms of integer. You mean this? No, yeah, spin up and spin down. Ah, here, um, then, as I said, this is temperature equal to zero calculations. If it's finite temperature calculations, I need to plug in Fermi distribution function as a function of energy and put the integral to infinity. But this will be up. Now I listed out the degeneracy of uh, the Fermi electron gas. I need to plug in to the Fermi distribution function this energy up and down. So the Fermi distribution function for up and down will be slightly different. Um, and then I do the calculations. This is how to get this. But if I'm at zero temperature, at zero temperature, non-interacting electron system, I replace the Fermi distribution function by the step function. And therefore, the limit of integration will be up to the Fermi energy up and down, and that's it. So this equation will be replaced by the integral from zero to infinity, density of states of the energy times Fermi distribution function up minus Fermi distribution function down the energy. Okay? So for temperature equal to zero, I calculate this susceptibility is constant. For finite temperature, do this calculation yourself after my lecture. Yeah. Or yeah. wait until next Friday. Or first take a textbook of statistical mechanics, Landau Lifts, Volume 5. Learn how to deal with the integrals, do your calculations. This is a result which you're going to obtain. As I said, this is tiny corrections. For real realistic metals, it's of the order of 10 to the power minus 4, 10 to the power minus 5. Therefore, realistically, finite temperature do not play any important role in changing susceptibility. As I said, it's less than 1%. It's 1 promille at most. Therefore, whenever I can do it, and whenever it makes sense to do calculations at zero temperature, I prefer to do it because it actually makes my calculations faster, efficient. If I need to get elaborate corrections to it, I know how to do it. Okay? The situation will be dramatic for local magnetism because for local magnets, the susceptibility diverges as one of the temperature. We will see it. This is a Curie susceptibility. Um, and therefore, we will need to proceed, to proceed in a very different way. Here, I have a free electron gas with actually large density. Say, we have 10 to the power 23 atoms. Each atom in the metal gives in a conduction band at least one electron. So we are dealing with a system of 10 to the power 23 electrons. Okay? Good. Diamagnetism. Where is this? Ah, here. So what I said in the first part, that paramagnetic state is associated with the quantum nature of the spin. 
So spin is a quantum number. It doesn't have any classical analogy. It's intrinsically quantum, and therefore paramagnetism is a quantum phenomenon. So the second part of my lecture is related to discussion of the magnetism associated with orbital degree of freedom. And from the first glance, it seems that the orbital degrees of freedom can be considered semi-classically, and therefore it looks like that there is a classical analogy. I'm going to show you that this naive expectation is very wrong. So, what we are going to say? We have electron which semi-classically moves along to some orbit. We have a magnetic field. And for the purposes of transparent calculations, of course, electron has spin and orbit. In the metals like alkali metals, lithium, uh, potassium, <coughs> the spin-orbit coupling is very weak. So therefore, spin and orbit are not coupled. In this situation of complete decoupling of spin and orbital degrees of freedom, we can consider spin and orbital effects independently. So for the purposes of my calculations now, I will forget about spin, because spin part can be added to uh, uh, magnetization and susceptibility at the very last step. This is just two added phenomena. Again, I'm saying that the spin-orbit coupling is negligible. If it is not the case, I can do this way. Um, so, I will concentrate on orbital degrees of freedom only. Okay? You see my logics? So, the Hamiltonian of electron in magnetic field. So, of course, the Hamiltonian is going to be very simple. It's P squared over 2M. It's free motion. But now, I need to adjust this Hamiltonian to the situation of the presence of magnetic field. So, we know that Operator P is minus I H nabla. This is a differenti differenti differential operator. In the presence of magnetic field, the operator P should be replaced by P capital, which is minus I H bar nabla minus E over C A, where A is a vector potential. Magnetic field B is connected with a vector potential as coral of A. So, I don't know which notations uh, you use to. So, sometimes in the literature it's written as a vector product of nabla and A. Sometimes it's written as rotor A. And sometimes it's written coral A. So, in order to make optimal notations, I will use this notation. Okay? So, we have a magnetic field, we have a Hamiltonian, which is now P squared over 2M. And this Hamiltonian incorporates a magnetic field. Okay? So, We not we treat nothing semi classically. I didn't consider large spin. Semi classically would mean large spin. Um, but spin is quantum, and from very beginning I considered spin one half because electron is a particle of spin one half, and there are no elementary quasi particles with a large spin. Sorry. Um, here, as I said, I forgot for the moment that electron has spin, and I'm dealing only with the orbital degrees of freedom. So, I need to solve the Schrodinger equation, which is H, this is my Hamiltonian, so H psi, I have three dimension electrons, is equal to E, e times psi, where the Hamiltonian um, is written, is given by here. But before I proceed with the writing Hamiltonian explicitly, 
I would like to make a certain gauge or certain shape of vector potential. As I said, I am considering problem in the constant magnetic field. V is a constant. It doesn't vary from point to point to point in the coordinate scale, uh, in the coordinate uh, frame. So there is no landscape of distribution of magnetic field. Magnetic field is uniform and equal to constant everywhere. So the quantum mechanical theory is gauge invariant. Therefore, it's my freedom uh, to take some specific gauge and work in some specific gauge. I explain what it means. And the first step, as before, I assume that my z-axis is directed along magnetic field. So magnetic field has only component along z-axis. Then I will choose my vector potential in the following form. So this is 0, uh, x times b, 0. Let's check that with this choice of the vector potential, I satisfy my equation that magnetic field, which is nabla uh, times b. So let me compute nabla times b. Nabla times b. Oh, sorry, nabla times a, which is this is determinant. So this is vector product. Vector product is determined. This is E x, E y, E z. Then I need to put D over E x, D over E y, D over E z. This is operator nabla. And then I need to put A. 0, x, B, 0. So this is how nabla cross A looks like. So I compute determinant E x times this minor d over dy 0, d over dx, x times b, 0. So this is e x times 0. e y times this minor, d over dz 0, d over dx 0, plus e y times 0. d over d e z, e z, and then I have this minor, d over dx, x b, which is b, minus 0. So indeed, nabla cross a gives me magnetic field. But now I already specified how my vector potential looks like. Moreover, the divergence of A in this gauge, which is d over dx ax plus d over dy ay, sorry, plus d over dz az, is obviously zero. So sometimes divergence A is a scalar product Nabla on A. So these annotations I'm going to use. So divergence of A is equal to zero. The curl of A is equal to magnetic field. Now it's time to write down my Hamiltonian explicitly and write down the Schrodinger equation. Okay? Did you discuss in quantum mechanics and advanced quantum mechanics the behavior uh, motion of electron in the magnetic field? This is what I'm doing. So did you have this discussion? Yes, we did. Okay, then I will go quickly. So the Schrodinger equation, which is minus h bar square over dm, d2 over dx square, minus plus h bar square over 2m minus i a, sorry, this is 1 over 2m, uh, d over dy minus um, e over c x b square minus h square over 2m d2 over dz square psi is equal to e psi. So this is a Schrodinger equation. D over d square over dx square, y and uh, z. And my wave function depends on x, y, z. x, y, z. Now you see that the coordinate x is the only coordinate which comes into this equation explicitly. 
Therefore, I can, without losing any generality, say that psi x, y, z is equal to e to the power i p y times y divided by h bar times exponent i pi z z divided by h bar times psi which depends only on x because only coordinate x arrives contained explicitly in my Hamiltonian. If I make this ansatz, then I will transfer my three-dimensional Schrodinger equation to one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. So what do I have here? Minus h by square over 2m. Now, since the only coordinate is x, and this is the only variable, I will replace my partial derivative to the full derivative. So this is d2 over dx squared plus py minus e over c x b squared over 2m plus p z squared over 2m psi x is equal to e psi x. So I started with a three dimensional Schrodinger equation. However, almost immediately, I arrived at one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. I have my wave function now, which depends only on one coordinate. And let me massage this a little bit. First of all, this. I would like to write this term as m omega square x minus x naught. First, you see uh, that x is shifted by some value. So I can write down that x naught is um, p y c divided by e p. And then I will write down my uh, Hamiltonian in the following, my differential equation in the following way. h squared over 2m d2 over dx squared plus epsilon minus m omega l square x minus x naught square over 2 times c x is equal to 0. So where I will define x naught, omega l square is equal to e b over m c. So, this is called Larmor frequency, and epsilon is E minus P Z squared over 2L. So, we have motion along the magnetic field, this is my Z axis, and the electron moves on a spiral which goes along this Z action. So, this is the equation describing one-dimensional quantum oscillator, right? So, you see, very quickly, starting from three-dimensional motion, I arrived to one-dimensional quantum oscillator, and we know for one-dimensional quantum oscillator that the energy is quantized. So, E is equal to h bar omega L, and plus one half. Therefore, my total energy E, which I was looking for here, is E plus PZ square over M. So this is PZ square over 2M plus H omega L N plus one half. Okay? Now, I would like to address a very important question about Landau levels. So you see that now Landau levels are formed. You have a motion of a particle in parabolic potential. This is a parabolic potential. And in parabolic potential, you have a quantization of level. First of all, you have a zero-point motion. And then you have an equidistant levels, which are called Landau levels. So, the 
quantization of level is associated with orbital motion of electron. And this phenomenon is again quantum. In the classical mechanics, there is no quantization of level. All variables are continuous. Okay? So, now, Again, let's compare what happens in the system in the absence of magnetic field and in the presence of magnetic field. Now I would like to take two minutes detour and answer question of Maha of last lecture. Why we have this dp divided over 2 pi h cube? I think it's paramount, it's very important, therefore I will spend two minutes to answer. Suppose we consider our electrons in a box. So now the tool B is equal to zero. In the absence of magnetic field, free electrons, we adopt, we take a box Lx, Ly, and Lz. This is the size of the size. Uh, um, of dimensions, <coughs> and we assume that inside this box particles are free, no interaction, no potential, nothing. Zero magnetic field, no interaction. So, we are saying that we have a periodic boundary condition. This is Born karma. I already said you that this periodic boundary condition means that you replace a torus. This cube by, by torus but mathematically, it means that your wave function, I will denote it psi zero. X plus Lx, y, z, is equal to psi node. X, y plus Ly, z, is equal to psi node. X, y, L, z plus Lz, and equal to psi node. X, y, z. This is a periodic boundary condition. When we construct our block wave function, if we consider crystal, or if you just uh, consider free particles, it means that exponent to the power i px lx divided by h bar is equal to i py ly divided by h bar is equal to i pz lz divided by h bar is equal to 1. This comes explicitly out of periodicity from your boundary conditions. Okay? So, then, it means that when you quantize your momentum, you are saying that Px is equal to Nx divided by um, 2 pi nx, 2 pi nx h bar divided by lx. This is a quantization of the moment current from this condition. Okay? So then py is 2 pi ny times h bar divided by ly, and pz is equal to 2 pi nz h bar divided by lz. So to say you have three-dimensional rectangular well and your variables are separated and you have independent quantization along each of the axes. Therefore, I can write down the delta nx, delta nx times delta ny times delta nz is equal to, first of all, it is equal to lx, ly, and z from this condition times Delta Px, Delta Py, Delta Pz, divided by 2 pi h bar cube. Therefore, when I have a summation of a quantum levels, and x, and y, and z, since this delta is small, I can replace it by the integration, 
So Lx times Ly times Lz is nothing but the volume of my, sorry, of my cube, and then I have a d p divided by 2 pi h bar cube, and if I take into account the spin degrees of freedom, I also put factor. So this was Marcus' question on last week. Why do I have h bar, and why I replace my integral, my summation by integration of this way? Okay? Did I answer? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to answer and to ask you, if it is only to be the issue, um, the camera is clear and not clear. Is it not for me or can I have a question? So, what is not clear? Sorry. It's the same thing with me too. It's the same thing over here. Just question myself to see what is right in this part. Would, me, would you like me to write in bigger letters? Or what? Yes, yes. You can make your hand like that and make it bigger. Okay. I will avoid using the bottom of the blackboard and I will write down in bigger letters. Okay. Good. So, um, this is how we proceed with the summation in the box in the absence of magnetic field. Let's now see what we have in the presence of magnetic field. So I divide my blackboard into halves. And of course here the energy is equal to, so I promise not to write, energy, this chalk is terribly bad, is Px squared over 2m plus P y squared over 2m plus P z squared over 2. So here I have the same box Lx, Ly, Lz. However, the energy, so B is not equal to zero. The energy is equal to P z squared over 2m plus h omega L n plus 1 half. Please compare these two equations. On the left hand side, you have energy which depends on Px, Py, and Pz. On the right hand side, the energy depends on Pz and M. Therefore, if you write down the comp of your levels in the absence of magnetic field, so this is B equal to zero, then in the presence of B, you, comp, you collect many, many levels, which collapse into equidistant Landau levels. So this is B not equal to zero. Therefore, each Landau level is hugely degenerate, because you see many, many levels collapsed into the one Landau level. So I would like to repeat these calculations. Um, and compute the density of states and element of volume, which then allow me to proceed with the calculation of thermodynamical potential. Okay? So, first of all, um, I said that X node is what? Uh, C P Y divided by uh, E R B. I assume that my X node is inside the box. Okay? Which means that um, my T1, if I plug it in here, is between 0 and Lx E B divided by C. Um, one last thing which I would like to remind about oscillator, how this, I said that energy is quantized, is omega L M plus one half, but the wave function um, is written in terms of Hermitian polynomials, 
and uh, the ground state Hermitian polynomials psi is just Gaussian function e to the power minus x squared over a b squared, where a b is a magnetic lens. So a b squared it's inversely proportional to the uh, uh, magnetic field e b. And this is a bar c. Okay? So this is magnetic lens. Should be dimensional function. So then I will do the following. I change my momentum Pz, free motion, from Pz plus dPz. And I have corresponding dn or delta n z. Then, therefore, d and z, similar to what I have written here, is equal to d p z 2 pi h bar times L z. With n y, I need to integrate from 0 to, to p y. So, n y is then equal to integral from 0 to py d p y uh, l y the same way uh, over 2 pi h bar and therefore it is equal to um, l x l y divided by 2 pi a bar squared. You can check that this is correct. Therefore, dm, which is equal to, sorry, I will write it here, dm, which is equal to m y d m z, which is then equal to Lx, Ly, Lz, Lz, Lx, Ly, um, divided by 4, 2 pi a bar square, d, p, z, over h bar. So this is the same element of volume and volume which I got considering situation in the absence of magnetic field. And now, I, I'm ready to compute the density of states. The density of states, dn, let me rewrite this um, Again, this is a volume divided by 4 pi squared h bar square e b over c d e z. Or this is a volume times e b over c d p z over 2 pi h bar square. I explicitly keep h bar just to let you see how this exercise works. So, one of the volume, dn over d energy, is equal to density of state by the definition. Now, I need to take into account that I have a spin degenerates. As I said, these effects are separable, they are additive, now I put factor of 2 for the spin. So this is 2 EB over C D P Z over D energy divided by 2 pi H bar square. So this is a density of state. How can I find PZ? I find PZ from here. So P Z 
is equal to plus minus square root over 2m energy minus h omega l n plus 1 half. I assume and you see that there are two branches. When I take a square root, there are two branches. Therefore, without losing any generality, I can take one branch, therefore I can put a model and multiply it again by two. One factor of two comes from the spin. Another factor of two comes from the fact that I am using two branches of square root. And now, volume times density states is equal to 4 times volume divided by 2 pi h bar square eb over c and now I take a derivative so the derivative is 1 over square root 2m e minus h omega l n plus one half, and I have two m here, um, and that's it. And there is one half. So, so this is the density of states for the electrons in the presence of magnetic field. You see that this is dramatically different from the density of states of free electrons. Moreover, whenever your energy Fermi energy crosses the Landau level, you have a bundle of square root divergence of the density of states. Actually, this density of states, square root divergent, uh, gives me direct access to discussion of integer quantum form. This is called Landau fan. Like, you know, women use fan in Asia in order to ventilate the air. Um, but what you need to know here, and I will need for calculation, for calculation, that the density of state has one of the square root divergence. We will see similar divergence when we discuss superconductivity. Okay? So, now I am ready to proceed with the calculations. Before I do it, my very last comment. If we are in a classical statistical mechanics, uh, what do we do in order to compute thermodynamic potential? Uh, in the presence or in the absence of magnetic field? In the presence of magnetic field, we elongate our momentum, uh, which is adding the vector potential. However, all quantities, all computation of thermodynamic potential omega is related to integration of a continuous variable, Px, Py, Pz. Therefore, I can incorporate um, this vector potential by shifting variables, and as a result, my thermodynamic potential omega doesn't depend on magnetic field. That's it. In quantum mechanics, we have a quantization of level. This is, by the way, one of the questions on admission exams in CISA. Uh, is quantum magnetism, orbital magnetism, is quantum or not? <coughs> I'm saying that for quantum situation, instead of having variables Px, Py, Pz, we have a variable Pz and we have a discretized level. Therefore, our thermodynamic potential omega will be <laughs> given by integration of a continuous variable Pz and discrete summation of Landau level. So therefore we cannot shift variables anymore and our thermodynamic potential will depend on magnetic field. What we are going to do now in remaining 20 minutes, I will do it quickly, you follow me, we compute thermodynamic potential omega. Take derivatives with respect to magnetic field, we find explicit dependence on magnetic field, take derivative, compute magnetization, and susceptibility. So this is a plan for remaining uh, 20 or 15 minutes. Okay? I will need a lot of space. And what I'm doing is called Landau diamagnetism. Landau dia magnetism. And again, it is quantum because it is related 
to the quantization of levels, Landau levels. So, omega is equal to minus temperature, again, Kb is equal to 1, but H bar is not, sum over Landau levels. Um, sum of all levels, like, let's say, logarithm 1 plus e to the power mu minus epsilon, which depends on Pz and n, divided by temperature, which is minus 4 volume T divided by 2 pi h bar square times E B over C. I already plugged in the density of states. So this is integral from 0 to infinity d energy. Let me put all m and pz. Um, here I have um, um, I've already put dpz over the energy. So this is um, one mass on a square root over 2m energy minus h omega l n plus 1 half um, times uh, log 1 plus e to the power mu minus energy so this is, I plug it in density of states, which is d, p, z modulus over d energy. I replaced um, my integration over summation, and of course I need to take summation over n. So I have integration over pz, and I have a summation over n. And I plug it in the density of states. Are you with me? Okay, if so, you remember how we computed this thermodynamic potential this omega? Is this, this thing? Yeah. This one you have for the numerator uh, after the summation. This is because of the density of states. So this is what? This is integral over d p z uh, times summation over m. Then I can multiply this integral dPz d energy delta energy minus E P Z n um, and sum over n. So then this integral is a density of states. So then I write it as a sum over n integral over d energy uh, density of states over energy which is d modulus pz over d n, if you like, and the rest. So, and then I plugged in the density of states, which was computed just a few lines before. Okay? Okay. Good. So, in order to compute this integral, unfortunately, I cannot put temperature equal to zero right away, because my integral is proportional to temperature. So what I need to do is to compute it by part. I remind you that integral u dv is equal to uv minus integral v du. So this is my function u. So this is function u, because I would like to differentiate it, and get a Fermi distribution function. And this is my function dv. So I continue here. This is equal to minus 4vt divided by 2 pi h bar square times e v over c. I open the bracket. Sum over n. So this is dv. So v is then square root over 2m 
E minus h bar omega L n plus one half times log. Let me not repeat the argument of log in the limit from which limit? You see that this square root is defined is defined if this energy is first of all if n is larger than something or the energy is smaller than something for given n. So we can say from one hand the n should be given should be bigger than something at given energy or energy should be given should be bigger than something at given n. So since we fixed n in summation we say that epsilon mean to infinity. And epsilon mean is given by condition that the square root <coughs> is equal to zero. So minus integral from zero to um, infinity. Now I have um, V du. So this is square root over two n e minus h omega l n plus one half. And the derivative of the logarithm gives me one divided by one plus e to the power mu minus epsilon over temperature times e to the power mu minus epsilon over temperature times minus one over temperature. Because this is a derivative with respect to energy. Again, similar to previous lecture, let me first look to this term. At the lowest limit, we have square root equal to zero, because this is a definition of minimal energy. So this term equal to zero at the low limit. At upper limit, this exponent is equal to zero, because this is large energy. Therefore, one plus exponent is equal to one. And logarithm of one is equal to zero. Therefore, this term is equal to zero. What remains is this term. We have a minus and minus, which gives a plus. And finally, we have one of the temperature and temperature, and we can cancel the temperature. And from now on, since I have a Fermi distribution function here, I'm fine to take zero temperature limit. Because all the rest will be related to corrections of fit-terminal potential, which will be proportional to temperature squared. I was not able to do it from the very beginning, because the integral itself was proportional to temperature, so I need to be more careful with that. But now I did it, and from now on I use the temperature equal to zero limit. Again, I strongly recommend you to do this derivation step by step. I have like 10 more minutes, I will sketch this derivation, but I will nevertheless present all important steps. So omega is equal to minus 4 times volume divided by 2 pi h bar square E B over C. I have summation from n equal to 0 till the biggest, let me say n max, I will define it later, I have an integral from h omega l n plus one half to the Fermi energy, because now I plug in the Fermi distribution function, at zero temperature this is step function and it cuts me integral of Fermi energy. The minimal value is, is coming from the definition of square root. So I have a D energy, and I have square root over 2m, energy minus h omega l, n plus 1. You see, I have much simpler equation which I still need to compute. So, now I proceed with integration. I proceed with integration, integrating square root gives me 2 thirds, and then I have a function to the power of 3 half, so this is then minus 2 thirds volume divided by 4 volume, 2 pi 
h bar square e b of c. I have square root over 2m coming out of integration sum over m equal to 0 till Fermi energy over h omega l minus 1 half. This is a maximum l which I can afford and I have Fermi energy minus h omega l n plus 1 half to the power 3 half. So this is how I proceed with integration. So far, this is exact. I did not make any approximations except putting temperature equal to zero. However, now I need to proceed with the summation. This is the last step. I need to adopt some approximation. And this approximation is known as Poisson formula, which allows me to replace summation by integration. You can say, aha, I can do it right away. I just replace uh, sum by um, the integral and that's it. Unfortunately, this is not sufficient. I need to take into account the next term in the Taylor expansion. So, Poisson summation tells me if I have sum over n equal to 0 to n node, some function fn. This is precisely what I have. Then, this is equal to integral from minus 1 half to n node plus 1 half f n dn. This is how I replaced my integration, my summation by integration, plus actually minus 1 over 20 form. So this is so-called Mark Lauren term. And this is f prime at n node plus 1 half minus f prime at minus 1 half. So I'm not going to derive this formula. Again, you can look into the textbook. This is called Poisson summation. And I will proceed with the computation of the sum using this Poisson summation. So let's establish dictionary of what is what. First of all, what is. So, a node is equal to Fermi energy divided by H omega L minus one half. So therefore, a node plus one half is equal to Fermi energy divided by H omega L. You can estimate how many terms we have in the summation. In the magnetic field of the order of one tesla, uh, H omega L is of the order of one kilo. Fermi energy is of the order of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 kilo. Therefore, there are some, something like 10,000 to 100,000 terms in this summation. Nevertheless, by using Poisson summation, I will arrive at a very good approximation for this summation. So, this is evident about F, uh, N node. So F N is equal to this. This is F N. This is Fermi energy minus H omega L N plus 1 to the power 3 half. So F prime N is equal to 3 half Fermi energy minus H omega L N plus 1 half to the power 1 half times minus H omega L. So F prime at N node plus 1 half. N node plus 1 half is a Fermi energy um, over h omega l, we plug it in here, Fermi energy minus Fermi energy, this is zero. F prime of minus one half is equal to 
minus h omega l times 3 half times Fermi energy to the power 1 half. Because this term is gone, Fermi energy to the power 1 half. So now what remains is this integral. So the integration of this square root will give me not square root, the integration of the function to the power 3 half will give me function to the power 5. The integral fn dn is equal to 2 half because of integration. Fermi energy minus h omega l n plus 1 half to the power 5 half divided by minus h omega l. And now I need to take it in the limit minus one half and node plus one half. Again, at n node plus one half we have zero. At minus one half we have Fermi energy to the power um, five half. So this is plus two feet Fermi energy to the power five half divided by h omega l. Good. And why did I do that? You see then, this integral itself gives me a term which is inversely proportional to magnetic field. I remind you that Larmor frequency is Eb over Mc. But I have magnetic field in front of the summation. Therefore, the integral itself will cancel me magnetic field. And therefore, the first term which originates from this integral is magnetic field independent. Therefore, this is why I needed to take into account this Mott-Laurent term in the correction to Poisson summation. If I plug in everything now, I am almost done. I did not promise you that it will be easy lecture. This is tough lecture. And next lecture will be even tougher. Because the life in general is not easy. So, omega. I subtract this minus omega node. As a home exercise, do this. Write down omega node and check that this is precisely what we computed as a two sort of energy at zero temperature at the last lecture. It will have the same dependence of the Fermi momentum and so on and so forth. Because this is magnetic field independent term. And we are doing, in a sense, um, expansion, Taylor expansion. So, omega minus omega naught. I did it on a piece of paper. You do it on your piece of, piece of paper, collect all terms. This is equal to plus one six mu bore square magnetic field square MPF divided by pi square h cube times one. So we computed first magnetic field dependent term in the Taylor expansion, and we obtained that this is proportional to magnetic field square. And the sign, what is most important, is plus. Now, magnetization, which is m per unit volume, is equal to minus 1 of volume d omega over dp. So therefore, it is equal to minus mu bar square density of states at the Fermi energy. Uh, this is density of states at the Fermi energy divided by 3 times magnetic field. So what you see here, that magnetization for diamagnetic case is also directly proportional to magnetic field, although it has a sign minus. Therefore, electron which moves semi-classically on the orbit, since electron is charged particles, creates a magnetic field which goes in the opposite direction in order to compensate applying magnetic field. This is in the core of diamagnetism. Therefore, the susceptibility, which is dm over d magnetic field, 
which is minus one third magnitude board square times density of state at the Fermi one. So you see that this is diamagnetic magnetic susceptibility. Paramagnetic susceptibility or power susceptibility as we compute is equal to plus mu bar squared density of state at the Fermi energy. From this we can conclude since diamagnetic susceptibility is negative but comes with a critique one third that as I said we can sum up two effects and it's always our metal should always be paramagnetic because we just subtract one third and that's all. However, the nature tells us that this is not true. So we do have diamagnetic metal, which do not create induced moment, in particular copper. It is diamagnetic. Um, what is the resolution of this puzzle? Um, and the resolution of this puzzle is actually not very simple. We say that paramagnetism, and I remind you that the Bohr magneton is E H over 2 MC. The paramagnetic response associated with degree of freedom, spin degrees of freedom, is attributed to bare mass of electron. So this is inversely proportional to M naught. However, the diamagnetic response since your electron moves in some environment, um, is actually inverse. You have a different Bohr magnitude here, which is inversely proportional to M star, which takes into account the effects of environment, where your mass is dressed by interaction with environment. Therefore, x dr divided by x para modulus is equal to one third. M node over M star square. If M node of M star square is larger than the third, then the diamagnetic response can be bigger than the paramagnetic one, and as a result, uh, the metal possess diamagnetic properties. Summarizing, we considered um, today two effects associated with the spin degrees of freedom and with the orbital motion. We did this computation, we computed uh, the response and obtained that in both cases magnetization is directly proportional to magnetic field, while in the paramagnetic response it comes with a sign plus, in the diamagnetic response it comes with a sign minus, and we computed susceptibility, which is a constant with the same temperature corrections which I discussed before. The homework for those who would like to do it. First of all, please go along with those calculations and read the textbook. Second, you can proceed with the same calculations for two-dimensional electron gas. You will find it very interesting. So, please do it. And for those who would like um, to have very advanced homework, actually, do something interesting. Namely, please add Consider that both in paramagnetic and diamagnetic case the masses are the same. Combine um, the spin and orbital um, Hamiltonian together and compute energy. What you see that the energy actually, uh, in the case of motion of free electron, energy can be written down in a very interesting way. This is H bar formula L, and then you have m fermions plus n volts. So, n bosons is attributed to this oscillator degrees of freedom. It can take wave 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But n fermion is just attributed to the fact that you can have either spin up or spin down. So you see that your Hamiltonian, if you write down and replace this energy by some Hamiltonian, you write down as operator fermions and bosons so this operator is F dagger F, and this is V dagger V. So your Hamiltonian is symmetric with respect to fermions and bosons, and this symmetry be between fermionic and bosonic sectors is known as a supersymmetry. So this is supersymmetric quantum mechanics, and those who are curious to learn more, 
either ask me questions by email, I give you reference where to read, or you are entering a very interesting, actually, area of supersymmetric quantum mechanics, where the symmetry between fermions and bosons is preserved. I doubt that you um, had discussion of this supersymmetry um, in the advanced quantum mechanics uh, lectures. It is really advanced because this supersymmetric, supersymmetric quantum mechanics was elaborated by Edward Witten in 1974. So this is not beginning of 20th century physics, and this is one of the very interesting development of quantum mechanics nowadays. Okay, I'm done. Well, you probably, some of you who connected five minutes before beginning of lecture heard my discussion with one of uh, uh, my colleagues working in computer section. Uh, they told me that these days uh, they have, first of all, a lot of work and very few people, because some people are on quarantine and some people, so they have paramount amount of work and not enough people to do. Therefore, I apologize on behalf of myself and on behalf of them, that uploading of lectures would probably be a little bit more, will probably take a little bit more time. We cannot help with this, uh, because, you know, people are human beings, uh, even if they work 24 hours without sleeping, without eating, without doing anything, they can still do very limited amount of work. And this is understandable. So, please be patient. Um, uh, those of and today I forgot to push recording. I'm sorry, so YouTube lecture, Zoom lecture will be anyway available. Um, sorry for that. Um, it doesn't mean that you miss uh, anything, but um, it will take a few days. Those who would like to um, watch lectures anyway can, in principle, watch a lecture from the previous year. I can send you a complete list of links on YouTube. Uh, this is a little bit different because today I had more discussion for this quantum box. It answering Maha's question. It was not contained in this uh, YouTube video recording. Again, and I never teach the very same way. But at least it will be some compromise. So those who would like to watch first three lectures immediately can go to YouTube and watch lectures of the previous year recording. Or 2018-2019, you, you will find at least two versions. Um, those who would like to get precisely this lecture being recorded, please wait for two, three days. So after a weekend, I think it will be available. Okay, thank you. So in principle, for you it's lunch time, right? I'm not going to delay you anymore. Those who would like to proceed with lunch, please go. The lecture is finished. Those who would still like to uh, ask questions, I'm available to answer your very urgent questions. Well, I just have a suggestion. The, um, the previous two lectures, the camera was good, but today it has not been okay. Okay, I will write to ICPS because look, when I'm standing and writing on a blackboard, I cannot check the quality of videos because I am concentrated on doing calculations, writing all equations in the correct way. But if you have some concerns, some complaints, don't be scared by the word complaint. If you have some something to report, send it to me, send it to ICTS, or I will transfer it to ICTS. You are saying that today the quality of video was not very good. I will tell it to my colleagues that they will come and improve um, uh, the uh, functioning of video camera and check video again. Okay? But I hope very much that soon, well, Soon, I cannot quantify the word soon, we will be able to meet in person, or at least meet in person with some of you, because it cannot stay forever like that. And we all need interaction. I need interaction with you, you need interaction with me, you need to ask me question in a real-time scale, not waiting until I finish. Yeah, so, but this is the reality which we have. I'm sorry about that, I'm doing my best, and everybody is doing their best. And I hope that you are also doing your best by studying, 
by learning and uh, by having passions that to the situation which we have now. Okay? Then we meet next week. Monday and Wednesday there will be two lectures devoted to um, electric gas subject to cool interaction. Uh, I spent two lectures for that. And Friday next week there will be first tutorials given by Andre, the same person who uh, did a tutorial for quantum mechanics. And I'm, wel I'm welcoming all suggestions and all sorts of criticism. Okay, then if there is nothing to discuss today, we finished, we are done, have a nice weekend, work hard, uh, but also spend some time for rest. If weather permits, please take a walk, but please don't, please respect the safety rules. You received a message from the secretary yesterday. Um, so, the safety rules is first of all for your safety and the safety of my colleagues, your friends, everybody who is around you. So, please, please be patient, respect these rules. Good. Okay, then, goodbye.